This is Creating Your Encore Career and Becoming a Silver Entrepreneur with your host, Lynn Freest. Lynn will share ideas and expert advice from people that are walking in your shoes and living their encore careers, where they want and at the pace they want. You'll start a company of one with confidence and knowledge to live a fulfilled life of freedom and ease. Lynn is a coach and leadership consultant whose mission is to show senior leaders and experts how to start something refreshing and new after a full career in the corporate environment. Well, hello, and welcome to this episode of Creating Your Encore Life, where you can learn to do the work you love when you want and where you want. And you can be creating value in the world beyond just winning that next pickleball game or binge watching some more Netflix. Instead, you can live your dream. And if you're ready to get started today, please contact me at lynn at lynnfrius.com. As always, thanks for listening. This is episode 209. And I've got the title for it is What Might Happen with 100-Year Lives? And again, I've talked about this idea before, but I just wanted to go through and summarize an interesting study. It's the Stanford Study on Longevity, and they've pulled together a whole bunch of people, and there will be a resource link that you can go there yourself. So they have quite a bit much more content that I'll be able to cover in this short podcast. But again, it's a fascinating piece of work, and I think it's well worth time spent thinking about it. So this new map of life project, which was initiated by the Stanford Center on Longevity, it attempts to go through and see what are the changes going to come with this change in how long we live. When they first started a social security program in Germany, this the retirement age was 65, and actually very few people reached that age. So now we're at a point where even in today's world in the U.S., average lifespans are in the 80s, and it's expected to go even higher so that people who are born today, they can expect about half of them or more can expect to live to be 100. So it's going to become not exception, but fairly commonplace to have people around and relatively healthy around for 100 years. A big thing in the study was it's not that this idea of aging is a hard stop. They're trying to take apart this notion that at age 65 or whatever you may say, that's when people stop working, they stop contributing, anything like that happens because it's simply not true even in today's world. So the, so the idea now is, hey, we've got a, if you think you graduate from college or your official education at the age of 20, there could be easily 60 years of active life for you and with another 20 years of semi-active or, quote, retired life. So it's we've got the much longer lifespan and or I should say lifespan and health span than we ever had before. What's that mean? What's it going to happen? And this is kind of what the study has tried. They and again, it's a collaboration of a lot of people, but they tried to research it. So some of it we just have to redefine our definitions. It used to be that you went to school, you went to work, and you retired. The schooling was about 20 years long. Work might be 30 or 40 years long. Retirement was maybe 10 or 15 years long. But now we just have to think about that. One, it's just, quite frankly, longer. But two, we should start thinking about it just in different stages. And quite frankly, they suggest that it could be those stages are interrupted and we work or we take time off from work to raise children, take care of aging parents. We return to work. So it's this whole idea of we just have to rethink and aging. And plus, you wouldn't say that everyone from the age of 20 to 50 is the same. Obviously, we segment society quite a bit there. So why would we say the people from ages 60 to 90 are all the same? They're not. Now, the other thing they would recommend from the study is we think about stages as opposed to ages. Because quite frankly, we may have people at any age, but but people at 60 could be in very poor health, whereas people at age 90 could be very active. Again, we'd have to think about everyone will be somewhat different going through here. Just as some people have children early in life, some people have children a little later in life now. But these are all different stages of our lives, not necessarily just defined by age. Another thing that comes up in this study is this whole idea of we push the older age group aside like they don't really mean much to our economy. And yet, 
AARP estimates that people over the age of 50 actually account for half of all consumer spending. And I've seen some other studies where the people, my peer group, accounts for a significant amount of the actual wealth in the country and how it's going to be spent. So some of these things are, we just need to be rethinking. Again, people don't retire at 60, die at 65 and transfer their wealth or not. We have to be thinking that's going to work differently moving forward. And that gets to be this, the second point of talking about being more flexible in life transitions. And this is what I'm interested in now is how do I help make people make transitions? Because it's probably no longer going to be as simple as, oh, you make a transition from college to a job and that's it. Obviously, in today's world, most people make transitions to different jobs. Now that's going to continue, only it's going to continue longer. So if you might have had four grand job transitions in the past, now it could be six or seven job transitions, Joe. And three of those job transitions and reinventions will occur after the age of 50 or 60. It's that idea that we also have to, as a society and personally, hey, we're not collect all the education we need in those first 20 years. We're going to have to be collecting education. And again, this isn't something new. We all recognize that. I see that as I pursue a new career at age at over 70. I'm learning new skills. Some of this was my research for this. Well, I'd read all the articles myself, organizing the information. I helped use chat GPT to help me organize some thoughts on it. So there's new skills that each of us will develop and we'll be developing them at age 70 as well as at age 20. The, the other thing is, I think we just think of the world is changing and every generation has said that's changing faster. Well, and that's true. It'll never change this slow again as we move forward. But that inherently means that I can remember back when I was on a school board and people in education then were saying, we're trying to educate students for jobs that don't yet exist. And that's going to be true moving forward. So if you hit 60, there are going to be new jobs that you could do at 70 or even 80, but they don't exist yet. So you're going to have to be in the market for how do we re-educate ourselves? And, and likewise, I think whether it be companies or governmental institutions, we're going to have to continually be rethinking these things as how do we be prepared to make transitions throughout our life? And as companies, the idea of how do I help offboard people, maybe for child rearing or child care years? How do I onboard people that have been out of the workforce for whatever reason? Maybe they are caring for elderly parents, but now they're ready to step back into more of a, either a full-time assignment or at least a more active assignment. But how do we do those things? And then the idea that there's going to be these periods of reinvention that we all have. So how do we, as a company, how would we organize sabbaticals so that people could take time off to acquire those new skills that we know we need? We know they're great people, they're great for our organization, but we need to give them time to acquire new skills. So how do we set up some program of, say, sabbaticals or training that we support people later or throughout their lives, not just later in life? Another thing is then the government has a role and the government is, they don't always adapt real quickly, but they do have to adapt because again, so much of we have, the rules were defined years ago, the laws were defined years ago. So even though it may be hard and it may be a challenge, we have to rethink this idea because it is going to be different. The world of our parents, the work the governmental rules around that govern life for our parents, it's going to be different. Now, I have no perfect insights into what to do or how to do that, but there is something to know that we'll have to recalibrate as we sit, find more and more people in those ages above 70. And again, though, the piece I talked about earlier, lifelong learning, we have to find ways to both personally encourage ourselves to lifelong learning but also for companies and the government to say, okay, we're going to have people going into a learning environment multiple different ways at multiple different times. So it's going to be, it's going to be different as we move forward. 
Another interesting piece they talked about is age diversity in the workplace. And I've heard this in multiple articles where they say, we've got five different generations in the workplace. People could say that's going to be hard. On the other hand, it brings a lot of very interesting possibilities because we have people asking new questions. We have people that have experienced a wider range of issues in history. Instead of just reading about things in history books, we are going to have people there who actually experience some of those things. So it's going to be interesting. And yet there are different interests, although interestingly, the younger people in childbearing years want flexibility in their work. And that's what people in their 60s and 70s want is flexibility in work. So some of these things, we make up stuff that this applies to this age group or that age group, when in fact, it's just, it's just things that apply to people not any particular age group. Now, I will say that, and the studies have shown that of the diversity and equity inclusion programs, not many of them actually talk about age. So it's one of those things that we, we'll have to see how that can improve so that people are, age is one of the last things to really enter into the diversity equation. It's still acceptable to say, hey, we've got to move people on because they're old, some of that will have to change, I think, going forward. And what's been interesting, too, because in today's world, we say we have more jobs open than we have people to fill them. Well, there's a variety. We're getting new talent from new places to help fill them. But again, we, the Bureau of Labor projects that 30, 36% of the people ages 65 to 69 will remain on the job in 2024. So again, that's we're going to represent, I think, about 23% of the workforce right now, the total workforce. It's one of those things where you've got people potentially on the sidelines that could still be contributing. You know, then the, the retirement systems, I think we can all see where they're not really geared to really working well for this long period of on-ramps and off-ramps for work life. <clears throat> they're geared for life as it was in the 1950s. We need to be thinking about, is retirement more of a, is it the 401k or is it the, they have educational accounts now for people to help save money for their children. Maybe all of that gets merged into some sort of a retirement educational account system. Who knows? But it's that kind of thing where all of a sudden with people entering and leaving the workforce in multiple times in their lives, the retirement system is probably going to need some work. Another thing is companies need to get involved in this because one of the things I saw instead of a, a particular company not only had internships, but they had returnships. So they were trying to find ways for people who are planning retirement or already retired to come back. And sometimes this has involved women who have finished their child caring years and want to return. So that was a very positive thing to start those things. But that may be expanded now to include other people. How do we help people step back into the workforce, especially when companies have great people that have worked for them before, they stepped away for whatever reason there was. Now, how do they help them step back into that workforce that the, where they can contribute again? Then another item they talk about in the study is healthcare redesign. One of their themes there is, yes, older people may require more healthcare. On the other hand, much of what they say is we need to focus more on not just the treatment of disease, but prevention. How can we help people lead longer and healthier lives? I think I've read where almost 60% of all illnesses and infirmities, you can't influence them with changes in lifestyle. So again, that whole idea of how do we help ourselves and each other live healthier longer is going to be a very interesting piece. And again, with technology, it's going to be interesting because there's all kinds of things that are possible in the day that weren't even possible last year, and that's going to continue to be true. Then the other piece, the last piece, they talk about this has to be inclusive. So the 100-year life has to include all social strata and has to apply to everybody. So we need to, again, we can't guarantee the outcomes for every person are going to be the same, but we need to have at least equal access to health care equal access to some of these resources so that they can retrain people, join and make those transitions between old jobs and new jobs, or those transitions from 
home for child caring and then back into the workforce. So that has to, in some fashion, be available to everybody and encouraged for everybody. Again, we need everybody included in this and maybe not just the people who have been there in the past. So all in all, I think the new map of life for the Stanford project, it's, it's got a positive note. I find optimism in it, even though it points out all the things that we probably need to change or have different. I still find it fairly optimistic. I look forward to seeing what's going to happen. And I encourage you to go to their website because they have, as I said, a wealth of information and even more things that you can pick up on and learn from. So I encourage you to visit their website. So wrapping up with an encore life, you can be creating value in the world beyond just winning the next pickleball game or binge watching Netflix. You can do the work you love. You can do it when you want. You can do it where you want. And you can live your dream. So if you're ready to get started today, please contact me at lynn at lynnfrius.com. Or you can head over to my website at lynnfrius.com, maybe sample a few podcasts and get on the email list. So we'll see you soon. And thanks. Thanks.